You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. There's a good reason why breakfast TV hosts are among the biggest celebrities in the country. Even though far less people actually watch them than the stars of primetime, it's a much more intimate and long-term relationship. Sometimes it goes on for decades. Lisa, Koshi, Carl, Mel, Natalie, we feel like we know them. And we do in a way, because unlike newsreaders and game show hosts and the stars of TV dramas or reality shows, breakfast TV hosts can't hide behind auto cues or plot lines or editing. When you're doing three hours of live TV every day, unexpected things happen. And you have to react instantly. You cannot hide who you are when you're streaming live on air for 15 hours every week, which is what makes the sudden and massive popularity of Lisa Miller so unexpectedly fascinating. From Mamma Mia, you're listening to No Filter, a podcast where people from all walks of life tell their stories very candidly and aren't afraid to be vulnerable. My name's Mia Friedman. Lisa Miller is the host of Australia's most popular breakfast show, ABC News Breakfast, alongside Michael Rowland. She's a Walkley Award-winning journalist and she's covered some of the biggest, most difficult news stories in the world, including multiple terrorist attacks, mass shootings and natural disasters. But being a proper TV star and a celebrity is very new to Lisa in ways that are both wonderful and incredibly difficult, even painful. Lisa has written a book called Daring to Fly about some of the extraordinary things she's seen in her career as a foreign correspondent and reporter, and most of it very nearly didn't happen because of an absolutely crippling fear that almost derailed her life. Here's Lisa. What time did you get up this morning? Funny you should ask because I woke up early. I woke up at 2.15 a.m. and I, my alarm goes off at 3 and so I thought, can I send myself back to sleep for 45 minutes? And the answer was no because it's been a pretty big week. It's been a pretty big couple of weeks actually. So I've been up since 2.15 a.m., which is why I think this is a very risky choice by me to talk to you on a Friday afternoon. (laughs) It really is. I hope you've got a glass of wine. We're talking at two o'clock in the afternoon. So you've been up for 12 hours already. It's your night time in terms of your body clock. Yeah, if I had a glass of wine, then I would definitely be going to sleep again. (laughs) But you know what? Here's the thing. People love getting their head around when you wake up and the sleeping hours. And I do think it's interesting. And when I was taking on the job, it's all I kept asking Virginia Trioli about. I said, how do you sleep? When do you sleep? How do you go to the toilet during the show? And also, do you eat before the show or during the show? And so they were the things, it wasn't so much actually the job because I thought, well, the job is journalism. That's what I've always done, right? So I think I can do the job, but it's all the logistics that go into it. So I get it that people are interested in that. But for me, it's the most regular work I've ever had that I actually know exactly when I'm waking up and when I'm going to bed. And I don't think I've ever had that in my whole career. Well, I need to know the answer to those three questions. How do you manage the sleep thing? When do you go to bed? I go to bed at eight o'clock at night. I don't nap during the day. I try to exercise when I start getting the afternoon slump. So I'll make myself go out and do a walk or, you know, when we're not in lockdown, I'll have a tennis lesson in the afternoon. So it makes me move. And the toilet thing, I'm really glad that, you know, we've raised this so Mm. early on as Mm. well into the podcast because there's a little toilet just behind the studio that is for on-air staff only between 6 and 10 o'clock. So I'm able to go out there, make use of that bathroom and get back onto the couch in 90 seconds. 90 seconds. And what about your radio mic? Do you have to make sure you turn that off or (laughs) leave that on the couch? 
No, I don't leave it on the couch. It's too hard to reconnect yourself. But um, the floor manager, Joe, who a lot of people are familiar with because he's got this great hair length, silver hair, and occasionally he'll pop into shot and we love it when he does. He'll always say, kill Lisa's mic, kill Lisa's mic. <laughs> <laughs> he is very good about that. He <laughs> does not let me walk out of that studio without my mic being completely dead. Love Joe. I'm glad we're doing the important stuff first. Yeah, I thought I'd, I'm, I told you I'm a lot like Lee Sales, you know, our mutual friend and your bestie, except the difference is that I end most of my interviews with, I love you, which she doesn't so often. That would be so awkward. <laughs> which for would her. be so awkward for her. I should have started this interview by saying, hey, Queen, because you are now the Queen of Breakfast Television. Um, you, you and I have many friends who are on television and I have seen, we've both seen the toll that that can take and the scrutiny that's applied to women that's just not applied to men. When did that occur to you that that was now your life? Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, it's funny how people initially felt so happy to give me their thoughts about my body shape or my clothing or my hair or, and the other thing which really amazed me was that people were offended by my laugh and they'd say stop laughing so much you're sort of you're you're gushing and actually that was the one thing given that my middle name is joy and I Mm. actually love to laugh Mm. that did not bother me I thought that is so weird and anyone who doesn't want to hear laughter Mm. needs to go and just take a look in the mirror but then there's been you know don't wear that skirt again Stop waving your tuck shop arms around. You look awful in orange. (laughs) That stuff, you know, I can cope with that stuff too, actually. I can cope with that. It's kind of funny. I, you know, say, hey, everyone, look at my wobbly tuck shop arms. I was a triathlete once, (laughs) believe it or not. But for the last few months, I've been, I think, the target of an organised bullying campaign on Twitter that I've seen pylons on people and I've seen people talk about it and the toll that it takes. And so to be involved in one, to be the person that they're piling on, just really shocked me. And Mm. I'll be honest with you, I came off air one day and Michael and the EP and our supervising producer were in the green room with me when a tweet was sent through to me that was accusing me of bias because of the story that we had led the program with. So a decision that had not even been my decision, but it had been retweeted 200 times with the hashtag Lisa Miller bias. Uh And I looked up at Michael and Emily and Tyson and I just said, I don't have a hope here. Like there is nothing I can do. They have decided that I am the person they want to vent all of their anger at. And I started crying. I started crying. You know, it does, like I've covered so many different stories and uh, I'm, ang- I'm not angry at myself, but I mean, I haven't admitted this to anyone else before that we had this moment in the green room. I think people like to think we're a bit bulletproof, but we're so not. And so after that, I thought, oh, this can't go on, you know. Mm. So I just silently and without any fanfare, I didn't put anything on Twitter. You didn't announce your resignation from Twitter. Yeah, I just deactivated my account. Yeah. You know, I spoke to the bosses and I said, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. They were fully supportive. Yep. And then it was about four days after that that the trolls discovered that I had gone and that I was no longer available for them to attack me. And that just launched this incredible, ugly, unfair, misogynistic attack that has totally taken me by surprise. I mean, enough that the MD of the ABC has messaged me and said, are you okay? You know, to which I really appreciate David Anderson doing that. I mean, it's just, I'm pretty angry about it actually, because I think that we allow this platform to have that impact on us. And I think it's time to say, actually, this is going on and it's women who are at the centre of it. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it with other women and I have tried to defend them and I have blocked people who treat people badly. But it wasn't just about me. They would bring in the politics of my dear, darling, dead father who entered politics in 1974 
as a country party MP and they used that to accuse me of bias. They do not see the irony that they are accusing a 52-year-old woman of having the politics of her dead father and they don't think that that is sexist or misogynistic. Mm. I I mean, it is a sick, it's a sick world, Mia, mm. and it's a sick world on Twitter, quite frankly, at the moment. And this has just proven to me that it was absolutely the right thing to do to deactivate my account and it will stay deactivated. I'm so glad I came to the same conclusion a number of years ago and at first I thought I could just people go, oh, just don't read your mentions, just don't read what people say about you. Firstly, that's hard <laughs> because it's just human nature to want to know what people say about you. I did that for a while and then I realised because, you know, as a journalist, it's a place of work for us. You know, there's lots of people that follow you. You want to use it to promote your book. I imagine you had tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of followers. You want to use it to promote your work. You want to use it to source stories and news. And I was the same. And then you realise I'm supporting a platform who allows me to be abused. And yeah, I just, I imagine Michael Rowland doesn't get the same. I imagine... Tony and Nate probably get a different kind of abuse. Mm, they get a lot of love though too, let me tell you quietly, yeah. and so they should, and so they should. And so everyone should, but there's something about being on Twitter if you're a woman. Yeah. I just don't think it's healthy. So I'm so glad Thanks. you're not there. And it's interesting that the thing that broke you was an accusation of bias. It wasn't the tuck shop arms and the, <laughs> you know, you look like this and you look like that. Well, just because... I've worked so hard as a reporter for more than 30 years to be so straight and so neutral and to make the people and not myself the story. And it just really frustrated me. And I just had to think, they don't watch me in the mornings. These people who are hating and trolling, they've just Mm -hmm. joined this pile on. They don't know Lisa Miller, the reporter. They don't know the work I've done. They haven't seen me standing outside the UN during the Iraq war debates. They haven't seen me at the Sandy Hook school shooting. They haven't seen me on the streets of Paris. They are just joining a pylon. And, Mm -hmm. yeah, I can deal with any comments about tuck shop arms. That's fine. But to insult who I am, I guess, as a journalist was the thing that I just had to say, no, this is done. That whole side of it, you know, what you wear, what your hair looks like. I mean, you've been a broadcast journalist for a long time, so you're not completely disconnected from your appearance, but it's very different when you're in someone's lounge room for hours and hours every morning. I remember Lisa Wilkinson used to be endlessly surprised at the number of opinions people had (laughs) about what she wore and what her hair looked like. And Carrie Bickmore would say the same and Lee Sales would say the same. What's your relationship with that whole side of things? Are you girly? Do you do you like to think about what you're going to wear every day? No, this is so funny because the beautiful hair and makeup staff, oh, my God, they're so fantastic. They are so professional. But the last thing, they'll do my hair and makeup and then they'll say, what colour lipstick? What are you going to wear today? And I go, oh, I don't know, like something that fits me. <laughs> I put so little, I have not made a decision about any of those clothes. The ABC Mm. got a stylist to help purchase them. I'm so happy Mm. to be wearing them. I like Mm. colour. I just have no interest. You know what I love most about the lipsticks is the fact that they have wonderful names and I will choose them. (laughs) So sometimes I'll say, well, let's choose the lipstick. Let's choose, right, Dancing Queen. I am going to be Dancing Queen today. (laughs) And then I have to go to my wardrobe and go, oh, my God, what goes with Dancing Queen? (laughs) And that's how I choose what I wear sometimes. So you have clothes that are chosen by a stylist because there are all these considerations people don't know. But when you're sitting on a couch, it's got to be something that from this angle and you can move and that doesn't look funny. I remember when all those newsreaders bought that same Scanlon theatre, yet the penis (laughs) penis neckline, the penis jacket because the neckline inadvertently looked like a penis. Um, do you have to choose from what's put in your cupboard? Yes. So no one lays it out no, for you the night no, before? No, no, I choose well, that it. That would be nice. Yeah, but the stylist has done a very good cheat sheet for people like Lisa Miller, which is on Pinterest, <laughs> where she said, this goes with this. 
and this, <laughs> even to the point of these are the earrings, Lisa, that go with this top. But, you know, Obama wore the same blue suit for eight years and Karl Stefanovic wore the same suit yeah. for one year because that's mental load that you don't want to have to carry if you have to think about what questions you're going to be asking Scott Morrison. Yep, exactly, exactly. And so I don't have any of that load in the morning other than it takes so much time. It drives me crazy that Michael slips into the chair and in six minutes he's done and he's out the door and he's back researching and he's reading the papers yeah. and and I've got my eyes closed because even though I love Eyeshadow what they do blending. at the end they're doing a beautiful mm. job but you're stuck you, it's not useful time is how I feel it even though it is time that has to be spent there yeah but it's a tax that women on TV have to pay that yeah. men don't yeah we don't have the research time mm. <laughs> I want to take you back to your honeymoon well just before your honeymoon you're at the airport you're about to get on the plane, you're newlywed, and you're in floods of tears. What's going on? Yeah, we were heading to London and then Spain and then Greece and then Turkey. Sounds hideous. Two months, yeah. No wonder you were crying. I, I am not only crying but I am saying to my new husband, how could you do this to me? How could you make me get on a plane for our honeymoon? And it was at points like that that I realised that, man, I was in a lot of trouble with the fear that I had. But, yeah, it was quite a scene at Brisbane International Airport, let me tell you, because, you know, it was such a family affair, the wedding. I've got a massive family. So my mum and dad's best friends had come to the airport to see us <laughs> off as well. So it's <laughs> mum and dad, mum and dad's best friends, my husband's mother, <laughs> and we're all there. And I am sobbing, berating my new husband for having thought of this wonderful mm. honeymoon. I mean, it wasn't a surprise to me, but I had thought that I would be able to handle it. I mm. kept thinking, you can do this, you can do this. But once I got to the airport and the ticket was there in my hand, I realised that it was just going to be so completely overwhelming. And for the entire honeymoon, I ticked off every flight that we did with a sigh of relief because it was one less flight that I had to do to get home. You weren't always scared of flying. Your book's called Daring to Fly and you've got flying in your family. But something happened when you were a junior reporter and you were in the air. Can you tell me about that? It was a flight that we took, a charter flight that we took from Townsville to a mine in central Queensland. It was one of those rushed jobs when the 7.30 program had rung up and said, hey, we need an interview with this mine manager. You know, can you charter a plane? Which we did quite often in North Queensland because it was the fastest way to get around. We'd go out to the airport, cameraman and myself. It was a six-seater. We flew down to the mine. We did the interview. Just before we were leaving, the mine manager said, oh, actually, we're going to be letting off some explosions, so you're going to have to just hold off on your departure. I could see the pilot did not like that news, and he didn't like that news because he could see the weather, and from that airstrip at the mine all the way back to Townsville was just a string of thunderstorms. And so the flight home he is trying to dodge all of the storms. And of course, that's taking more fuel, right? So he's looking at his fuel, he's looking at the flight path, and I'm in the back feeling fine. You know, the rain is lashing against the window, but I'm so comfortable with planes. My dad had been a, a pilot of small aircraft. I was okay. I knew we were safe until the pilot decided to flick from one tank of fuel to another to the reserve tank and there was an airlock in the engine on the left hand side and so the first thing I knew was when I heard the propeller spluttering on the left and as soon as that happened the aircraft dropped slightly and the engine on the right was screaming trying to keep us airborne and I can remember my cameraman was sitting in the, the front seat and he just snapped his head around and looked at me and I'll never forget the contact that we made with our eyes and I don't know how long that moment happened. You know when things happen to you, yeah. you think, God, it felt like 10 minutes that we were falling. Yeah. Well, of course it wouldn't have been 10 minutes. It might have only been seconds, who knows, but the pilot was able to restart 
the engine. And so we then flew maybe another half an hour or so and landed in Townsville. And we got out of the plane and the pilot just said, sorry about that up there. And then he walked away. <laughs> and Pab, the cameraman and I, we just looked at each other and went, we were just shaking our heads. Wow. And then we jumped in the car to leave and we'd forgotten that we'd left the stereo up super loud. So when he turned the engine on, just this rock music pumped out and we scared ourselves oh, wow. ridiculously with this music and then, you know, clearly realised that we had had quite a scare up there. When was the next time you flew after that? Oh, the following week. And it was fine, you know. It was a, a flight to Thursday Island from Townsville. I remember thinking, oh, I've got a new feeling inside me. It feels just suddenly just a tiny, tiny little bit anxious, but nothing that I thought more about. And then there might have been another flight and then another flight. And each time that feeling just became a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And then there was this classic where we chartered a uh, we chartered a plane to go and cover the floods in North Queensland and it was a plane that didn't have a floor. They were able to open it up so we could film through the open floor. Oh, my gosh. And Lisa. Yeah, have, you not been, have you not been on of one of those planes? Of course oh. I haven't been. That sounds oh. horrific. Oh, no, it's amazing if you're strapped in. You've got to be strapped in. And you hold the camera down through the hole in the floor of the plane and you get great shots. This is what we did before drones. Drones came along and then we didn't have to do this stuff, you know. Thank God. I mean, I want to vomit just hearing about that. (laughs) But this pilot, he was an old Italian and, and he sort of gunned the aircraft a bit as we were taking off and seemed to just immediately take off and then just hover just above the tarmac and then sort of slowly, slowly got altitude. And I'd asked him why he did that and he said, because it saved wear on the tyres. So that was the kind of era of, you know, the light planes, the charter planes. But the point is, I guess, that it didn't take a long time. It was probably only a year before I then started having real issues even getting on a passenger jet Mm. and I started becoming quite physically sick. And if you told me that I had to get on a 737 to fly from one capital city to another, at least two or three days before that flight, I would get really irritable. I'd get really cranky and I would also start getting gastro, sorry, Mm. and I would vomit at the thought Mm. of getting on that plane. And then that just, I mean, honestly, from that point, that just became such a big thing where I then started trying to organise my life around you know, the flights. And I'm a working journalist through this time. I'd been in Townsville. I'd moved to Canberra to be a a young reporter at Parliament House. I did the entire federal election campaign flying around Australia, either getting drunk on the plane late at night before we landed, you know, somewhere to get ready to film the next day, or just being so panicked that people would come up to me and say, do you need someone to sit with you? Like, you know, it was so, it became such a thing. People knew about Lisa's fear of flying. I had a similar fear at a similar level and I was also having to fly quite a lot for my work, although not as much as you. For someone who's not scared of flying, they might think, oh, yeah, you get a bit nervous. Can you explain the thought process of someone who is scared of flying when we're in the air? you are going to die. Like you know you are going to die. Every single noise is the start of the plane falling apart midair. And you are beyond embarrassment. This is the thing. Like the fear is such a big thing that it does not matter that you go up to a flight attendant and say, the engine is making a funny noise, you need to tell the pilot. And that that is the kind of stuff I was doing. Mm. I used to say I was like Rain Man with everything, not just with all the crashes around the world, I knew all about them, but I also knew everything about how a plane should take off, at what speed, how much of the tarmac it should use, the pitch of the altitude. So if anything was not quite right, I was onto them. 
I was like, they're trying to hide this. Mm -hmm. We have only flown at 10,000 feet for the last 20 minutes. There's a problem. Mm -hmm. And I would not just sit there with that problem. I would go and tell the flight attendant and say, excuse me, I think we're going to crash. You have to tell the pilot. How would they react? They were pretty good, actually. I found them so understanding. And, you know, you sort of think, imagine if you had more than one Lisa Miller on your flight. Imagine if we'd have both been on the same flight. (laughs) We could have sat there and held hands. That's so true. (laughs) Actually, we wouldn't have held hands. Our nails would have dug in until they were bleeding. It's so true. And I always felt that when the plane landed, I was always shocked like, yeah. because it it's not like you're scared that you might crash. It's like, no, it's definitely going to happen. Like, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's I, certain. I couldn't go to the toilet. I couldn't go to the toilet on a plane because I didn't think my body could get me to the toilet mm. because my legs were permanently shaking. Mm. Like I would sit there just shake, 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 shake. I wouldn't take the food or the drink because I didn't want my tray down in case we had to go into an emergency mm. descent. And I mean, it just is every single second, isn't it? And like it's, it's exhausting. And what you said is so true about the anticipation. So it's not even just the flight itself. It's the thinking about the flight, knowing that you're going to have to get on the flight and then you arrive at your destination, even on your honeymoon, I imagine, and then it's thinking about the next flight that you've got to get on and how did you get over it in the end? Well, can I just tell you this other time that, well, it was this moment when my then husband said to me, okay, this is it, we have got to do something here. We had gone to Tasmania for the wedding of Pip Courtney, the landline presenter, and her beautiful husband who was my flatmate when I was in Canberra and a dear friend, John Bean, who we sadly lost in the ABC helicopter crash. So we were down there for their wedding. It was a really important day. I was going to be involved in the ceremony. All I could think about was how do I avoid getting on a plane to get back to Brisbane from Tasmania? I was looking at the sailing times for the spirit of Tasmania to see if we could get on a boat to Melbourne, hire a car and drive from Melbourne to Brisbane to avoid the flight back to Brisbane. And that is when Sid, my then husband, said to me, we've got to do something. This can't go on. It's ruining our lives. What did you do? I did a fear of flying course (laughs) and who knew it was so simple? (laughs) I mean, it was simple, but it wasn't simple. I had a great course and it was with ANSET just before ANSET folded. It was right before ANSET folded actually. And um, the, the instructor was fantastic. The most useful thing they said to me was that you have spent a decade building this fear up and it's going to take time and it's going to take work to get rid of it. Mm. And it probably took about two years. Mm. They do two streams. They have all of the technical stuff that I loved, which is why on um, QF131 was the air conditioning switched off and water coming from the ceiling at 5,000 feet, 180 kilometres out of Ballarat, you know, like, and they'd answer all those questions. Any question you asked, they would answer them. And then the other side of it was all of the really interesting stuff about how your mind works Mm. and that fear or flight Mm. and why the body reacts that way and why you become frozen with fear, but you're really preparing yourself to flee Mm. from the fear. And you can't run anywhere in a plane. That's the problem. No. (laughs) That's why it's so debilitating. I I would have tried. There were times when I wanted them to open the doors again so I could get off. How did September 11 impact your fear of flying? Well, that was probably about, I'd done the course about a year earlier. So I was on my way to recovery. And four days before September 11, I'd got the news that I was going to be the new North America correspondent. So I was in Brisbane and got the phone call. But of course, you know, look, you know, the fear of flying was so in the background given the enormity of that event and just the horror of it and also knowing that the job that I was going to go to in America was then absolutely, completely different. I was going to be moving to a country that had been hit by terrorists and would take years and years to recover from. Once I got to America, I moved to America a few months after September 11 then because it took a while to get your visa and, you know, it was my first posting. Once I moved there, look, it was not easy flying in America, but 
I kept working on all the tools that they had given me in the Fear of Flying course. And uh, I had my palm cards. They, they say to write out palm cards that remind you that a jet can take off on one engine <laughs> and also to no, no, it can. Don't you laugh. Wow. It wouldn't want to. It wouldn't be pretty. <laughs> exactly, as one of the pilots said to me. <laughs> and so I kept all of those and I would keep looking at them. Mm. And I loved United Airlines because on their in-flight you know, entertainment, you could listen to all of the chatter amongst the pilots. And so it was reassuring for me that I could hear pilots in plane saying, you know, we're at 3,000 feet above you and, you know, Roger, you know, over here, da-da-da. That's a really bad American accent, sorry. But that reassured you. One. That reassured you. Totally reassured yeah. me because I felt like they were all on it. Yeah. <laughs> they were all working to keep us separated by excellent airspace. <laughs> You've just reminded me that when I was scared of flying, I used to not ever want to go to sleep because somehow I'd have to keep the plane in the air with my mind. So I couldn't take my, I couldn't take my, my eyes God, off the job. So true. It's so true. Because <laughs> we are going to save that plane. That's so true. That is why. That is why I was listening to the in-flight entertainment. Yeah, it's yeah. it's hard it, to it explain to someone, duty. isn't it? No, exactly. I mean, I have got so much empathy and understanding now of people who have fears. Mm. I will always have time for anyone who wants to talk about a fear because once you've had it at that level. Wow, such an eye-opener. I'm Mia Friedman and you're listening to No Filter with Lisa Miller. November 2015, you were out to dinner with your boyfriend and he went outside to take a call. What was going on that night? We were in London. We'd just moved there. I'd just taken up a job as the Bureau Chief for Europe. It was very exciting. We had ordered a beautiful meal. It had been a big day. It was a Friday night. And Emily Smith, who was the Bureau senior producer at the time, was alerting me to the fact that there'd been a terrorist attack in Paris. She said, I think there are about 10 dead. We need to try and get there. And it was hard to try and get there. I called my partner back in. He was a Parisian. He was a Frenchman. And I said, something's happened in Paris. And we, we rushed back to our apartment, turned the television on, and it was all still happening in Paris at that moment. And so between me and Emily and the other staff in the office, we were madly trying to see whether we could get on the Eurostar. No, last train had gone. Could we get on a plane? No, the airports had closed. Okay, we were just going to have to try and drive to Dover and get on a ferry and get across the water and then drive to Paris. And if we got going straight away, then we'd be able to get there by nine o'clock the next morning, which would be in time for the 7 p.m. news. So, cutting it fine. Yeah. That was all happening that night. And so we did. We rushed. I threw a couple of things into a bag, not a lot, you know. I was thinking, wow, this is the first big story. I'm the bureau chief here. This is the first big story. What does it mean to be the bureau chief? Oh, well, you feel responsibility for other people. You feel like you should be able to be direct with your instructions and know exactly what to do. So you're in charge of the ABC European Bureau. Yeah, but I, I wasn't. Look, I was still so new and Emily was so brilliant. So she was absolutely fantastic. I was so lucky because the former bureau chief was still in London, Phil Williams. He was a friend of mine and he'd been having a bit of a holiday. And of course, Phil is such a workaholic that even though he'd left the position and was on holidays, he just went, I'm on it. I'm with you. We'll drive together. So it was Phil, me and an Italian cameraman who had started work with us that day, <laughs> Ali, his name was. And so we raced to the port and the arrangement with Britain and France at that time was that you went through French customs on English soil. So we pulled up to the French customs offices and the immigration and um, Phil turned to me, I was sitting in the back, and all this time on the drive, we've been watching, streaming the news, getting phone calls from the bosses and knowing that this has now turned into the deadliest terrorist attack that Europe has seen in many years, many decades. Anyway, Phil turns to me and says, got your passport? And I, 
I immediately knew I didn't have it. I didn't have it. I'd been so used to working in America where you just jumped on planes and went from state to state mm. without a passport and I'd done a switch of bags at the office when we'd raced in there because I thought, oh, no, I'm going to take my backpack because I'll need that, you know, not my handbag. Who needs a handbag when they're covering a terrorist attack? And also psychologically, in your defence, if you were going to an airport, you probably would have thought that, but yeah. you were going to get on a ferry and a car. That's my defence of you anyway. Yeah, thanks. Anyway, I didn't have it. And, of course, these immigration officials are pretty edgy because their country is under attack. Mm, And so I had to get my bag and get out of the car. Phil and Ali just said, we've got to keep going. And I said, of course you do. That's the right thing to do. So it's 2 o'clock in the morning and I'm at Dover Port and it's dark And I'm taken into custody by the French immigration officers. They took me into a room. I wasn't allowed to leave. Mm. I didn't have any French. And they came back after about an hour and made me sign documents in French, which I had no idea what I was signing. I just kept thinking, oh, my God, I hope I haven't signed that I will never go to France ever again. Mm. (laughs) Because I thought, could you just imagine that as the Europe bureau chief? Awkward. And then found a card on the wall, you know, for mini cabs. And I rang someone and said, Can you come and pick me up and drive me to London? I think it was about 300 pounds that they wanted in cash up front. It's about an hour and a half's drive from memory. Oh. So, um, and were you feeling so mortified? Oh, no, beyond mortified. I mm. thought I would be sacked. I just thought, I am a bureau chief and I can't even get to the biggest story happening in the world right now. Honestly, it was, Phil was fantastic. When I finally arrived in Paris, Phil said to me, mate, in two weeks, no one is going to be thinking about the fact that you didn't have a passport. And he was so right. He was so right. But I didn't tell that story for a long time, Mia, because I, oh, well, because I was embarrassed and I just thought it was unprofessional. But then I did start telling it because I thought, you can make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to sort of give encouragement to other people that you can screw up so badly that you think you're going to get sacked. Mm. But actually, that's not what happens. So you do eventually arrive and it's this unfolding terrorist situation. Your job is to cover these stories as they happen. What's going through your mind? Like I imagine you're running on adrenaline, but what are the logistics of what you have to do? Look, you have to work out where the live cameras are, where you're meeting up with people to do live shots. Emily did a lot of that logistical stuff, so that was great. You're thinking about where is your hotel? Can you get from there to the camera safely? What are the security arrangements? Are there any Australians? Have any Australians been hurt or killed here? It's that sense of just how do I cover this story? How do I do it? Who do I talk to? How do I get the information? And because it was just continued breaking, because the terrorists, the ones that had not blown themselves up, there were still terrorists who were out there. So you were just totally running on adrenaline. We tried to roster sleep between us all. There were six of us on the ground. It was the ABC covered it really well. I was really proud once the bureau chief had remembered her passport. I was very proud Mm. of how we covered that story because it was very important Mm. and you just get on with it. So a story like that is so big. There's so much to say. How do you do it? How long is a live cross and how do you filter and process and edit the information? Yeah, we split it between each other. You know, someone would do digital, someone would go to the hospital. But can I tell you about another story that I covered that might answer that? I got sent to an earthquake in Italy and it was a small village. 300 people ended up dying in this event. This whole village had virtually been destroyed. On one particular day, I found myself in a square with all the buildings down around me and we couldn't get out. They'd blocked the road. So my cameraman and I couldn't get to the press conferences that were being held out of town. And I rang Mark Colvin, who was the presenter of PM and a fantastic mentor, and I said to him, I don't have a story because I'm stuck in this square for hours. I've been stuck here for hours 
And he said, well, what's going on there? And I said, well, I'm watching one family sitting on rocks waiting while the search is going on for their grandma, but nothing's happened, you know, like they blow the whistle every now and then to stop the search so they can hear if someone's underneath and then they'll blow the whistle again and the bulldozers move in again. And I said, and then if they find something, they hold up a white sheet so I can't see it, but nothing's going on. And Mark said, everything's going on. Just tell that story. So sometimes, Mia, it's about not going macro, not going huge with the story, but just really narrowing your focus. And that particular story, I've gone back to look at it and listen to it again and again, because I think Mark just gave me so much great advice and friendship over the years. And the details I was giving were, you know, that they've come out with a jewellery box and they've handed the jewellery box to the granddaughter and she's bent over and has started sobbing. And it just conveyed so much more than going to a press conference outside of town would ever have conveyed because it was about the people and it was about the human story. doesn't matter if they were Italian or Brazilian or American or they could speak English or not. They were grieving like humans grieve. And being able to tell that story and have people in Australia listening and watching and understanding what was going on was the best advice Mark could have ever given me. 2017 was really an annus horribilis in terms of your career and the world. Can you just remind people of the things that happened that year that you had to cover? Oh, well, it started at midnight on New Year's Eve. I'd been home, I'd cooked myself a meal and I thought I'm going to go to bed early because there might be an attack because we'd seen the Nice attack the year before, we'd seen Paris, people were on alert. I got a phone call that there'd been a terrorist attack in Turkey and by 6am on New Year's Day I was on my way to Istanbul. Little did I know that it was then just going to be one attack after another. It was the Manchester Arena attack. It was the Westminster Bridge attack. It was the London Bridge attack. It was army on the streets of London. It was the scenes in Europe that we would send some people to. There were attacks in Berlin at Christmas markets. I mean, it was just this ongoing. And then when you thought that nothing more could happen, the Grenfell building fire happened. Do you remember so many people trapped in that high rise? I've spoken to James Glenday about this, who was in the bureau with me, and he said of all the stories he did, and they were some really terrible stories, he could not get that scene out of his mind of people silhouetted in the windows at the top of the building desperately hoping someone is going to rescue them as the flames are whipping up the side of the building. And then Mark Colvin died and then I I went to cover a story. I interviewed a fellow who I'd interviewed the year before and he was a terrific farmer in his 70s, such great company. He was so glad to see us again. And we rang him a couple of days later to tell him that the story had gone to air. And his secretary said he had died. His dog had got into the cabin of the tractor and he'd been squashed against a fence. Mm -hmm. And so it felt that everything that I was touching, everything that was around me was falling apart. Is that when you went to the dentist? Yeah. How crazy is that? I went to the dentist. I had one day off. Actually, it's not crazy. You know what it's about? It's about trying to find something normal Mm. when everything around you is abnormal. You sure know how to treat yourself, Lisa Miller. I've got a day (laughs) off. I'm going to take a rest from the death and devastation and terrorism by going to the dentist. Mm. And I put the goggles on and the dentist said to me, it was a woman, and she said, have you been flossing? And I hadn't been flossing. I have an issue with Mm. flossing. This is a conversation Lee and I talk about quite often. Mm. This is safe. This is safe space. I'm pretty honest about it, actually, because you can't fake it. Mm -mm. Yeah. But even with the dentist, I go, no, I haven't been flossing. And I felt the first tear 
you know, behind those big, thick plastic glasses they make you put on. Mm. And then she turned her back to go to the implements and all the rest of it. And and then the tears started coming. And then I started sobbing, like I couldn't stop the sobbing. But then I also started laughing because I knew what it was about. I knew that it wasn't about flossing. Mm. I knew this was about everything that Mm. I had gone through. You know, and so she spun around to look at me because, you know, here is this person in the chair and we had a beautiful conversation because I had to take the glasses off because they were filling with water and she said to me, I find it very difficult because the smell from the fire keeps seeping into this room Uh. and that was from the Grenfell building fire and she said, it makes me feel very depressed. And so we ended up having a conversation, a very deep conversation Mm. about it all and I was actually really glad that that had happened. This is the thing, I find ways to think, well, that was a weird, shitty situation and it had been a bad year but I'm so glad I had that conversation with that dentist. Mm. You love your job so much. I do. You're so good at it. Oh, thank you. Have, Have there been times when it's forced you to choose it over other things? Yeah. I don't think my then husband or my partner, Philippe, in London would have thought they were signing up for what they signed up for. But I I have loved it so much. That's Mm. the thing. It's do I have any regrets? Well, no, because I think you make decisions at the time that you think are the best decisions and... I can only think that, you know, I've had an incredible career. I hope there's a few more years in it. I barely had a day where I've woken up and thought, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, so I can't even think of a day when that happens, even when the alarm goes off now at three o'clock in the morning. Like, I just love it. I love the journey it has given me from small town Kilkeven in Queensland as a, you know, young country girl having this dream that maybe I could travel the world and and be in the middle of history being made and the people that I have met who have been so awesome just incredible people that I have met at their lowest lowest moments and then they just continually blow me away with their resilience and how they use terrible things that might have happened to them to then try and make the world a better place and I love being able to be an eyewitness to that and be Mm. up close to it and notice how I've now talked about everyone else and not about my own decisions in life and I see what I've done there Mia but of course you know you make decisions and yeah the ABC has come first that I don't have any regrets. Yeah, I think it's a misguided narrative to talk about choosing work over other things. I find that just too simplistic. What brought you home in the end? Well, it was the end of the posting in London, so it was a three-year posting, but I had lost Dad while I was in Europe and I wanted to come home and spend some time with Mum So we'd, you know, organise that my big sister was going to come over to London. She had lost her partner, sadly, and so she was going to come over to London, help me pack up. We were going to have a bit of a holiday and then head back to Australia and I was going to spend time with mum. I was going to take lots of leave and just hang out and reconnect with all the family. My big sister arrived in London and we got news that mum had become very sick in Brisbane. and. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know whether to jump on a plane and try and get back to Brisbane and we realised we weren't going to be able to do that in time anyway and my younger sister was with mum and so on my last day in the London Bureau at the end of a nine-year stint overseas for the ABC, my mum died and I felt ripped off. Mm. I felt I was so close to getting home and um, I had a great relationship with her. Yeah, she was an awesome woman. But I'm so grateful for the time that I did have with mum and dad. I I always came home every year, sometimes twice a year. I used to play Scrabble with mum online in whatever country I was in. It was hilarious because my mum was such a prude. She was such a lady, Mia. 
that I've, I ever played a word in Scrabble online that she found a little difficult <laughs> to sort of absorb. Like what was a word? What was a word? Well, clitoris oh, was one word. I rude. mean, there is nothing wrong with clitoris. It's very right? inappropriate. But my mum didn't play again for two days. <laughs> like she gave me the silent treatment. She took a turn. So I rang Wendy, my big sister, and said, I think I've upset mum by playing the word clitoris. And Wendy said, yeah, she's called me. <laughs> Isn't that gorgeous? That's so great. Oh, dear, mum. We never got sex lessons from mum, you can That's imagine. That's so great. <laughs> so you came home anyway. It was the end yes. of the posting. What was the plan? What were you going to come home to? Well, I was going to hang out in Queensland because I've got four brothers and sisters, 11 nieces and nephews, 13 great nieces and great nephews, Mm. many of them who were born while I was overseas. So I was so excited about reconnecting with Mm. them. And then they asked me if I'd come down to Melbourne and fill in for a month or so while Virginia Trioli took a holiday. And I did. And I enjoyed it, but then I went back to Queensland and then a few months later Virginia decided to go to another terrific job in Melbourne that she's taken and doing fantastic at and they asked me if I would do the job full time. And I ummed and ahed because I thought this wasn't in the plan to be coming home and then not being home, but Mm. I convinced myself that I could fly, I could fly back to Queensland whenever I wanted. And Michael Rowland was an old friend from Canberra. We'd known each other for so long. And he rang me and said, come on, it's fun. You'll enjoy it. (laughs) And little did we know what was ahead of us. And, in fact, I've spent less time with my family being in the same country than I ever did when I was overseas. But that is the plight of so Mm. many families at the moment. So it's just part of the deal. What's been the biggest shift from being a correspondent and a reporter to being an anchor? and a celebrity. Being able to have a personality, being able to let that come through, being able to laugh and enjoy the conversation and dive into things. I am really enjoying that. Mm. It took me a while to just relax. I mean, you know, this week I sneezed on air and we just all laughed and had a giggle. It's no biggie. It's Mm. brekkie TV. You know, it's okay when things go wrong. And I've really enjoyed that. The thing that I'm so shocked about, Mia, is that when I'm doing live crosses with reporters overseas, given how long I did it, how much I loved it, and how hard it was to finish up and come home, every single time I just think, thank God that's not me. Isn't that funny you say that because I was watching you this week and you threw to Isabella Higgins in Paris who was covering the Bataclan trials. Trial. And I was studying your face intently through my iPad thinking, is she nostalgic? Is she wistful? Does she wish that was her? And I also thought you were very disciplined. You didn't kind of go... I was there when that happened. You know, when it came back to the couch, I I was like, but she was there. (laughs) Yeah. No, the strength of the feeling I have is so reassuring Mm. because it means for me. You made the right decision. The job's done. Yeah. That's done. Yeah. That part of my life was incredible. You know, I travelled to more than 40 countries. I worked with the most amazing people, interviewed the most amazing people, and yet I'm okay with being home. I'm so okay with being home. I have to end by asking you about the secret exploration that you did with Lee Sales on the Great Wall of China. That was a headline I read a couple of weekends ago, and I must admit it sounded quite sexy and a little bit inappropriate and perhaps culturally insensitive to be having a secret exploration with Lee Sales. Do tell. It was a scoop. It was a scoop. It It was exclusive. A secret exploration with Lee Sales helped change my life. I know. I know. I mean, that's interesting though, Mia, and just to quickly fill people in, it was an excerpt from my book about a trip that Lee and I did to the Great Wall of China, which was unbelievable because we managed to spend a couple of hours on the Great Wall of China without seeing one other person because we'd been given the details to a secret entryway to the Great Wall of China. And I love that piece of writing. I was pretty happy with it. But the headline that popped up, (laughs) 
Oh, you're laughing. I do. I was I think, laughing so really, much. Would Michael Rowland get a headline like that? Secret exploration no, with Mark Willisy on the Great Wall of China? No. I thought it was a bit of clickbait that mm. had been uh, I, used. I clicked on it. <laughs> Well, you could have just rung me. I would have told you. I did laugh. I laughed a lot. I'm like, I read the book. Did I miss that chapter? But you and Lee, I want to end on female friendship, yes. actually. You and Lee are family to one another. How did you meet and what role does your friendship play in, in your life now? Oh, I'd be lost without my friendship with Lee. I mean, <laughs> we talk pretty regularly every day, of course. We are each other's sounding boards. <laughs> if we have rants that we want to do we say it to each other before it goes into an email and we make the wrong decision and embarrass ourselves we met because we are similarly very punctual and we were the first two to turn up at a farewell dinner at a Chinese takeaway in Brisbane for staff members and I saw this woman sitting at the table the red and white checked plastic tablecloth and she was tapping her fingers as you see her often do because it was 10 minutes before everyone was due to turn up and where were they? And I don't know whether it's anything to do with her wonderful dad who sadly passed away, Dale, who was in the military. My dad was in the military. Mm. They were both very attached to the clock and Lee and I both the same way. So quite frankly, if you're not punctual, then you're not a friend. Oh, I don't mean that. <laughs> we we make exceptions for really wonderful people. But, yeah, Me, no, it, and it's a thanks. friendship. And then we went to America together. We were both appointed as mm. North America correspondents. So Lee and her husband at the time and mine, and we headed off on this incredible sort of time overseas as young correspondents. And we've just been friends ever since, even though, can I tell you a secret? At the time in Washington, there was a dinner when I said it was so wonderful to have Lee's friendship. And I wouldn't have said we were bestie besties at that point. And she said to me, well, it hasn't passed the test of time. And I was horrified. But I raised that with her every now and then, you know, if she sent me a text message at two o'clock in the morning because she can't sleep and she knows I'll read it in an hour, I'll say, just checking, has our friendship passed the test of time yet? How many years has it been now? Oh, 25 years, yeah. <laughs> give it another decade, yeah. give or take. Yeah. <laughs> the book's phenomenal. It's such a delight to wake up with you every morning. Like it really is. And please don't ever stop laughing. No, oh, thanks, Mia. I won't. I promise. I love you. Oh, <laughs> you said you'd say that. Lisa's book, Daring to Fly, is available now on Booktopia. And we'll link to it in our show notes. It is a great read. And if you want to hear an interview with one of Lisa's co-hosts, you might like to check out my chat, if you haven't already, with Tony Armstrong, the sports reporter from ABC News Breakfast. One of the things I love watching about that show more than any other uh, breakfast TV show or TV show is the inclusion. There is an Indigenous Australian, there is a gay Australian, there is an Australian who uses a wheelchair that's one of the reporters it really is an actual slice of the Australian community in a way that you just don't see on commercial television. It's well worth a look. Thank you for listening to this No Filter. You can also join me, Holly Wainwright and Jessie Stevens, three times a week, Monday, Wednesday and Friday, where we uh, host a show, another podcast. It's called Mamma Mia Out Loud. And that's kind of my version of doing what Lisa Miller does. As opposed to um, the role that I play on No Filter, on Out Loud, it's light and shade. We talk about all the stories and the things that women are talking about, the things that women are actually talking about. And you can find it wherever you get your podcasts. The assistant producer of No Filter is Lucy Neville and the executive producer is Eliza Ratliff. I'm Mia Friedman and I'll see you on the Mamma Mia app where you can find everything. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures.